Hi, I'm James Eade at the Eade Foundation. You can call me Jim. This is the 49th episode of The Chess Files. The answers are out there. And it's brought to you by the Eade Foundation. The Eade Foundation is dedicated to building communities through chess. If you're part of a community, you're never alone. And uh, today's episode is uh, part of a series that we've just begun, Unsung Chess Heroes. And so my guest today will be uh, uh, reveal to you in just a moment because i want to tell you a little bit about me and a little bit about the foundation first um you know i was started out as a chess player and i started out playing in 1972. no bonus points for guessing why my first rating was 1296 in 1972 when i was a senior in high school i was the highest rated high school player in new england and I won a lot of adult tournaments, including the eighth Vermont State Championship. Actually, I was a co-winner with John Curdo, the uh, many-time New England champion. So I got good very good, very early and uh, in my chess career, and I thought I was hot stuff. Uh, and I did get a, to become an FM. And what is an FM? Fide Master. It's uh, you're 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 known throughout the world as a chess master. So that was the title that I wanted, but you know, everybody wants to be a grandmaster and FM is good enough to fight with grandmasters, but not good. Enough. You know, I fought with them again and again and again, you know, but they were really strong. This is Grandmaster Yermolensky and I never got to be a grandmaster, but you know, I turned my attention to other things like chess organizing, grandmaster tournaments, uh, grandmaster norm tournaments, international norm tournaments, that sort of thing. And I got into chess writing and publishing, and I published a book, which I think is the best selling for any living author, um, just for dummies. And so I kind of did a lot of things and I got this award in 2020, I think the year was 2018. Yeah, August maybe in 2018 for outstanding career achievement. You know, so now I'm doing video. And um, I'm talking to other people about all aspects of chess. And then it dawned on me one time, there's a lot of people in chess that just don't get the recognition they deserve. So that's enough about me. But what about the E Foundation? The E Foundation, as I said before, is building communities through chess. It doesn't matter what country you're from, what language you speak. If you're part of a community, you're never alone. There's a lot of people out there that can just walk into a chess club or dial in and or dial in, uh, log on to an uh, internet chess uh, server. And, you know, it's easy to become part of a chess community, but there's a lot of people that don't have those access. And that's what the foundation tries to help. Uh, we try to help people that don't have the resources to join a community. So we help them build a community wherever they are. So far, we've been around the world and uh, we're just getting started. We want to keep going, but you know, I'm scrolling across the bottom of your screen. You see my Eid Foundation and uh, you can't do it alone. So we need donations and um, I'm asking you to log on, make a donation because help me help them. And that's my spiel. But, you know, we do a lot of different things. Uh, we, we do online scholastic chess. We do uh, senior center chess. And, you know, and that website I just pointed to, you know, it got an award as the best chess uh, website. Wow. You know, so we're doing a lot of things, but uh, we, we can't do it alone. So um, that's enough about the foundation. Uh, what I want to do today is bring in an unsung chess hero. And I've known him for a while. Uh, his name is Hannon Russell. Hi, Hannon. It's Hi, Jim. Let me uh, just take a second here, and I'm going to change my background so it fits in the screen a little better. Bear with me, because my producer is just not, not helping me. OK, there we go. Um, Hannon, thanks again. Uh, I wanted to tell you about, I think the first thing I, I, your name came up with was in translations. We're going to get into your entire chess career as much as we can in, in the short amount of time we have. But you, you, you were fluent in Russian. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, that was my major at Yale. Ah. Russian, Russian language and literature with a minor in French. Languages were really the only thing I could really do well. And I, I knew that. Um, at, at that time, uh, uh, you also, everyone, all the liberal arts majors had to take a science course 
and the so-called gut course was uh, geology. And to this day, I think they passed me because they did not want to see me again. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I graduated high school with five years of French, four years of Latin, and four years of German under my belt. Um, I had no Russian. Uh, I had started to poke around with Russian in high school, but when I got in, uh, when I got to college, I decided I wanted to major in it, and my minor was French. That is cool. So you know, I I just I'll get back to your tr the translations that, and your um, the some of the translations you did were like a Russian classic, uh, Dvoretsky's and Game Manual and things like that. I but I'll get back to that in a moment because my new producer's in my ear. I've got to start with the human interest questions. You know, where are you from? Where do you live now? And how did you get started in chess? Well, um, for most of my life, I've been in uh, southern New England, uh, in and around the uh, uh, Milford, Orange, West Haven area of uh, southern Connecticut. I uh, was born in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, we came to Connecticut, I guess, when I was a, a toddler. And um, about uh, six or seven years old, uh, my father taught me how to play chess. I think that's uh, a parent teaching their child how to play is pretty common. Yep. Um, also pretty common is he's, he's really stopped playing with me after I started beating him. Exactly. Uh, so um, I started playing serious tournament chess uh, in uh, well, when I was 12 or 13 years old. Um, that was well over 50 years ago. Um, it's actually about 60 years ago. And um, uh, you know, I just I just got hooked on it like uh, so many thousands or millions and millions did. Um, I sort of languished around the 1900 to 2000 uh, range until um, the late 60s or early 70s. Um, uh, I started getting better. We had a there were at that time the New Haven Chess Club uh, was fairly active, um, and it had some. Uh, Bruce Amos, the IM, uh, the Canadian IM, was, was a graduate student in mathematics at Yale. He was around. There were a few others. Um, and uh, I mean, I told Bruce Amos, we had, uh, we played three times and um, I drew tri twice and beat him once. And I told him they should give me the IM title. Uh, uh, he didn't think that was so funny. Um, right, right. They don't have a sense of humor. Anyway, right? yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, I wasn't, play, you know, raising a family, you couldn't just uh, ignore them and go about playing chess. Um, so my activity was spotty, but by the mid 80s, um, uh, I had my master's rating. Um, I kept that on and off for about 10 years and then Father Time took over. Um, and, uh, you know, now you're not only battling on the chessboard, you're battling Father Time. And um, I, I'm still convinced that uh, now, when I sit down at a tournament and, you know, you've got a lot of young kids there, um, one of the first things they're thinking about is whether I'm going to be able to stay awake for the whole game. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, anyway. I, my last tournament was the U.S. Senior Open. <laughs> the kids are just too scary now. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's interesting. You mentioned Milford. My, my dad was uh, born there, and I was born in New Haven. So, okay. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, both my both my children were born in New Haven, uh -huh. um, and um, yeah, it's nice. We, my wife and I will be moving um, in a few months to uh, uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. But uh, oh. uh, so, and and uh, it, I I don't want to pry, but it, is this? Yeah, like, you want to pry? Yeah, I don't. I I, I want to pry in it, it because is this uh, like? climate change related or is this just an expense reduction is this you know what's the motivation because i've been looking around in new england and the prices compared to california are amazingly low and so I've been well, i mean everybody every every lo local real estate market has its own uh, um, factors that influence it but um uh, my wife is originally from uh new hampshire uh, uh and uh, so she's been wanting for 35 years to get back closer to her family. Uh, my business, my office and warehouse is in Milford, and that'll stay there. Um, uh, my son 
we have we have two companies. We've got Russell Enterprises, which uh, is the book publisher, and you then we have that scrawl to reflect that. Uh, sorry, yeah, and then we have DGT North America, um, which my son my son uh, uh, runs. Uh, he does a very good job. Uh, we're the uh, North American distributor uh, for DGT products. Uh, they got some, you know, it's, it's an extremely popular manufacturer of, of clocks and virtually the only e-boards that, that have the uh, capability of, of uh, broadcasting in real time um, over the internet. That's what, that's what all the top tournaments use. That's where a lot of organizers and chess clubs use across the country and across Europe, uh, around the world, actually. So he does that. Um, uh, and but but that uh, the business side uh, of DGT will remain here completely. Um, I'll still be able to do the work that I need, editing and what have you. Um, uh, you know, at a, a mm. office at home, uh, uh, yeah. but the warehouse will stay here. So yeah, yeah. Well, that's the. I'm certain that the the real way I gotten uh, familiar with the name Han and Russell was. Um, uh, because of Russell Enterprises and the, the many quality books that you've that you've published over time. Thank you. So you're, um, uh, uh, you know, to me, you've always represented a quality uh, in chess and this DGT electronic broadcasting. You know, that's that's the way of the future of the present. And um, you know, I'm not at all surprised to hear that you're you're on top of that as well. Um, so you, you had a history both as a uh, we have this in common too, I think, as a chess book author and publisher. Um, so I, I did that. I was uh, publishing under the Mark Hypermodern Press, but you were in business a lot longer than I was. So tell we me started, what, yeah. um, you know, the very first book that we did, I had in, uh, in the mid 60s, um, I realized that uh, Shakhmati of SSSR, which is Chess in the USSR, the Russian magazine, along with um, Shakhmati Bulletin, which is uh, the Chess Bulletin, um, some great stuff in Russian, completely unavailable. And for a few years, um, we put out Shakhmati in English, um, but for a lot of different reasons, we couldn't really sustain it for more than a couple of years. However, uh, in my very first trip to Europe, um, uh, and um, just strolling down the left bank, there was an old, uh, there was a bookstore that specializes in all kinds of different books. And I found Tal's book on his 1960 match with um, Batvinik. Yes. And uh, by that time, I could make my, although it was early in my Russian language career, uh, I could see that this might be worth uh, pursuing. And, <clears throat> excuse me, in fact, that's what we did. Um, and that was the first book that was brought out. Um, I probably made at that point um, with the first version of the book, the first edition, uh, probably every error that could have been made. It was <laughs> wrong. Well, you know, I decided that it would be very cool to have a black cover uh, with white print. The problem is if it's not prepared right, when you pick up that book, you can see thumbprints and fingerprints and right. smears, and it looks awful. Uh, plus, uh, the book, the very first printing of the book, more or less disintegrated upon contact with air. So um, <laughs> it, it, was a, it was a disaster. The reviews of the book were tremendous for the content and awful, actually accurate for um, you know the actual production quality. Right. We uh, got a little better. Um, for a very brief period in time, um, the rights to that book were had been purchased uh, by Sidney Freed's company, RHM. Um, oh, yes. uh, he had a, he had some good ideas, but when Sidney passed, um, they reverted back in this case to me. Um, and by then, we I cleaned up my act and we we started getting the publishing right. Um, and it's been through a number of editions. Um, uh, so that was really what had, had put me on the book publishing uh, uh, track. We, the, the, the one item that sort of moved me, I was, I was practicing law. Um, I, gradu um, 
graduated Yale in 69 and then took seven years off. I was, I did various um, uh, things associated with real estate. And um, I entered law school in 1976, graduated in 79, um, and um, practiced law full time uh, with an emphasis on um, uh, commercial real estate, landlord tenant, uh, commercial landlord tenant, um, and the business law that uh, came along with all that. Um, but uh, I still, I was, I'm still greatly involved with chess which sometimes conflicted with, with my uh, law practice. Um, but in 90, the way 19, of chess. sorry, in the way of chess all the time. Yeah. yeah um, um, in ni 1996, I think it was 95 or 96. Um, I read somewhere that, that John Roycraft, of uh, the Roycroft, the, um, uh, one involved with end game studies, uh, some really fine stuff, was looking to put together a collection of, of um, Genrich Kasparian's um, studies. It was a brilliant, brilliant Armenian uh, study composer, and there was not a collection of uh, his studies. So I contacted him and we brought that out. Um, uh, it was, you know, uh, it, it did okay and commercially. Uh, again, I was learning a lot. And after that, um, a couple years later, the book started coming more and more. Um, uh, we did, uh, we had some of Edward Winter's books. Um, we did a, a, one of Hans Ray's books. Uh, and then at the beginning of the 2000s, about 2001, um, uh, I met with Mark Dvoretsky. Um, Mark had been uh, published in English by Batsford. Yes. Um, and he was very unhappy with them. He, in some, he, they, they had at least five, maybe as many as eight of his books. And he, he for, for some of the books, he hadn't been paid anything. And for others, it was just a mere pittance. And they, they, they jerked him around a lot. He was very unhappy. And then, of course, what happened is uh, Bathford declared bankruptcy. Um, and uh, after they came out of bankruptcy, which had basically wiped all their debt off the books, they approached him and said, gee, your books sell pretty well. Why don't we uh, do another book? And he said, I don't have a problem with that. Pay me what I'm owed. And they said, well, you know, that's all been taken care of uh, by the bankruptcy. And he said, thanks anyway. And he was looking for another publisher. And with the help of uh, Lev Albert, who I was friends with, recommended that he talk to me and make a long story short, uh, we became his English language publisher. The, the Endgame Manual has gone through five editions, yeah. plus a fast track yeah. edition. And he's got, we've done six or eight uh, other of his books. Uh, they're always well received. They're, um, they're terrific. And they're, you know, some of them are difficult. Um, you know, that MG manual is, uh, is not lightweight material, but it's a credible contribution, which is one of the reasons uh, I wanted you to have you on the show as an unsung chess hero, because, you know, that, and that Tal book, I guess I was lucky I didn't get the first edition, but I got it later. That was a great contribution to our, just our chess culture, um, making that in, available in English. Um, well, you so, know, about the Tal, Tal book. I met Tal. Um, I, uh, I met him in the press room of the 1990 uh, World Championship match, the New York leg of which I think appeared at the, um, it, was, it was a theater on Broadway next to a hotel that had been uh, fixed up for the match. And at that time, um, a very good friend of mine uh, uh, was Bert Hochberg. Um, oh, yes perhaps the very best editor Chess Life ever had, meaning no disrespect to anyone else, no, but- I agree. But, it, it, no disrespect to this many, many great editors, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's he, like Hall of Fame, he, I think. Uh, he, he taught me a lot. And he called me and said, gee, uh, he, he knew that Tal would be at a certain game and uh, would I like to meet him? Well, sure. Well. Um, we met, 
he knew who I was and he knew about the book. Now, the at the time, the books coming out of Russia before Russia had uh, become a member of the International Copyright Convention were essentially public domain. They took they took books from other countries, books and articles from in Russian were taken. Uh, but we talked, and I offered him. He was he was in in 1990. He was he was in a lot of pain from his kidney disease. Yeah. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he was drinking and smoking heavily. Yeah. Um, the uh, you know there's that classic, well yeah there, there's that classic story of a month before he died he got, came out of the hospital bed to play in a blitz tournament in Moscow and defeated Kasparov in the tournament. But um, uh, back to 1990, we talked and I said to him, look, it, it doesn't. Uh, we both know what the laws are or what they were. Um, if you'll write a, an introduction or a forward to the next edition of this. I said, I'll, I'll pay you very well. Um, we agreed on that. We agreed on the price. Um, we had a, uh, th that was more or less the end of our, our contact and I never heard from him again. And he, he passed away in June of, uh, um, when did he, when did he? Uh, about six years later, I think. Maybe two years later. I met him in San Francisco in 1991, but it was yeah. just, yeah, I think he passed up in June of '92, um, so that that never came to fruition. Right, right. But uh, a a great contribution, nevertheless. And uh, you know the the uh, synchronicity of uh, shout out to Lev Adler, uh, Grandmaster, former uh, multiple times U.S. champion. Um, but you knew him, and you were friendly with him, and so it, that connection got you in. And what you had done to to become uh, uh, a Russian language, the ability, your ability to translate into from Russian to English, um, all of that played a part into be, being able to add to our chess culture. Yeah, like, that was one of the, that was one of the things that my discussions with Mark would be sort of half in English and half in Russian. His English wasn't great, but he could get get by. Um, and uh, but at that time, the the undertaking for the very first edition of his Endgame manual was enormous. And um, in fact, we brought in two translators, um, Jim Marfia, uh, the oh, yes. uh, American translator, and Valeri Behm, who was Russian and then was living in Germany. Uh, he has since passed away, but they both did approximately half. And occasionally they would argue about what the best thing was. And Mark would say, well, you know, I would... I would referee it. Hannon should make the decision, is what he said. So that that went uh, that went okay. Um, you know, he was still at that time coming over to this country um, fairly regularly. He 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 continued that uh, where he would have his teaching seminars um, until he got sick. Um, I believe he had stomach cancer, and uh, at that point he had to cut everything off and. Um, he, he stayed. He, he stayed in and around Moscow uh, with his doctors, uh, so that they were easily accessible. As accessible, and then he finally passed in September of 2016. Um, so I, I think uh, I wanted to to mention this at some point. Um, one of the things I was um, familiar with Russell Enterprises is it was you're, you produced a chess calendar with all these dates. Uh, people when they were born, and I thought that that was a great contribution too, because you know there's lots of lots of little factoids that we didn't know, and and you mentioned Edgar, Edgar, Edward Winter, um, he, he was uh, one of those people who would correct stories that were misinformation that was out there, and so I l appreciated your calendar, which was just facts, you know, <laughs> yeah. that was a, that was a contribution as well. So, uh, you know, you, I, I call you an unsung chess hero, but you're very familiar within the closed chess circles. Everybody really does know you, does know about you. Um, but, you know, there's a broader audience and a younger audience that, that is not as familiar with your many contributions to chess. And that's really um, the focus of here. Wh what are you most proud of? What is, what is the one thing you would hang your hat on? Speaking of hats. Um, that you think you you really, really did a first rate bang up job that maybe you were put put in this place to for to do 
uh, and that maybe no one else could. Well, I, I, you know, I don't know that it needs that kind of kind of dramatic introduction. Um, I mean, these are, you know, when all is said and done, these are chess books. And um, uh, while you and I and others out there may think that that's the end all of stuff, there are a lot more things out there that, that are more important. Um, I think in general, um, uh, we, we, we treat our authors very well. Um, I've had a, a, a great amount of referrals from uh, authors who, who have come over to me from other publishers. Um, we've published some books and then they refer some of their, uh, uh, you know, their colleagues uh, to us. I could give you a number of examples, um, uh, uh, you know, where we have right now, uh, Max Flugi is, is working on a book uh, on the Queen's Gambit Accepted. Um, and um, he had been with another publisher. Um, when uh, the time was right, uh, he recommended that uh, um, Jan, that I talk with Jan Elvist, who um, yes. uh, is uh, he's doing on a black he's, doing, he's working on a black repertoire based against E4 on on the uh, the modern Gurdjieff. That's with where black fianchettos and then plays C6 D5. It, it has some. It has some uh, pawn structures that are similar to what you see in the Karo Khan, mm -hmm. uh, but with a fianchetto uh, uh, king bishop. Um, so we're working on that too. But he was he was a, a referral from Max. Um, right. uh, do things uh, always um, uh, turn out to be smooth between uh, authors and publishers? Oh no, uh, I had one author who was doing a biography on a minor. Um, a minor chess personality, and I agreed to publish it. And every so often, I contact the authors like I do and say, "How is it coming? Any idea when you'll be done?" Et cetera, et cetera. And he originally thought the book would be about two or three hundred pages. He, he then said, "Well, it looks like it's going to be four hundred. Is that a problem?" I said, "No, we can probably handle that." He then said it was six hundred. I said, well, let me think about that. And by the time I got back to him, he said it was clearly going to be over a thousand pages. Oh my I goodness! Said, well, I said, you know, uh, first of all, um, this is a we're talking about a minor chess personality, someone who had not a whole lot of influence or effect on the chess world. Um, and uh, number two, um, I don't know how we sell something like that. Um, uh, you know, unlike the the old Soviet Union, or maybe currently in Russia, um, we we're not funded by the state, right? And if we publish something, we have to try not to lose money. And um, fortunately, that has worked out for a lot of books. But even even then, there are some lemons. But eleven hundred pages. So I said we can break it into some volumes. And at that point, he went off the deep end and said, "Oh no, this has to come out in one book." And I said, how about if we part ways? That sounds like, and he thought that was just fine. And that's the, the end of the story. It was published um, in one volume by someone, 1,100 pages, and God bless him. That's right. So, yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things. We had yeah. um, um, Bruce Pandolfini, uh, we've got Mark Vretsky, we've got the German endgame expert, uh, Carl, Karsten Mueller, who's yes. actually fascinated with tactics, and we've done more more uh, tactics books by by him than we have endgame books. Yes. Um, but um, we've got a we've got a, a nice group of, of, of uh, authors, GMs, IMs, and um, you know we, we we try to do uh, the best we can to to bring them out. Sometimes you, you have a clunker and. and um, um, I tend to uh, I tend to view a book as both having commercial viability, but also a book that deserves to be out. For example, um, about three or four years ago, I was contacted by um, uh, a Greek uh, a master, Achilleus Zagrafis, and he had a man. His English was excellent. And he had a manuscript uh, connecting some of the theory of music with chess. And it was a fascinating book. Uh, wasn't that long. Um, it 
uh, we did bring it out. We had a lot of color plates in it. And um, it really, I think if you didn't have a large extended family, we wouldn't have sold any. <laughs> yeah, it, and it's, it, 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 it's a great, it's a terrific book. It's yeah. uh, but it just doesn't it didn't sell well. It didn't sell well. Um, That's the nature of the beast. Such is, you know, such is life. There are a couple books uh, like that we we've, we've brought out, and uh, you know, you fortunately you have some some very good sellers that help support the other ones, and um, if you can, you know make a make a dollar here and there that doesn't hurt either so right right but you're not retiring and eating bonbons by the pool based on that you know this this enterprise who, who told you what i do by the pool <laughs> oh and yeah. see we know people that know each other <laughs> Now, the thing I wanted to say, maybe I built it up a little bit too much, but I think in chess culture, uh, you know, if we can build that in the United States, uh, that's wonderful. You know, the the Netflix show, The Queen's Gambit, maybe they can do a follow-up to Queen's Gambit Accept It and have Max Delugi play in, a role in it. But um, the idea here is that, to, that you're making a contribution to the chess culture in the United States. Now, the chess culture in this old Soviet Union and current Russia, you know, that's a given. People know. Uh, and there's so much that we don't know in the general public in the United States about the value of chess and about the chess culture that we all share. Um, and bring, bringing the, the uh, old Soviet Union uh, and making it accessible to the, the Western English speaking audience you know, that's a tremendous contribution. But I think the thing that I got out of what you just said was that you, you develop trust. And that I associate with Russell Enterprises as the quality and that that it's responsible. You know, you, you can you can go to some some um, you buy a book from some publishers and you look at it, and you go, wow, it's filled with errors and things like that. Not just typographical errors, but, you know, uh, it's they're just sloppy work and I won't mention any names but there there are some people that uh, you can count on and I think the hand and Russell is one of those people well I appreciate the thought publishing uh, bring, bringing out a chess book without errors is one of the great challenges in, yes. in chess I've had a couple people a couple of authors uh, uh, give me their opinion that they don't think it's possible um, I think it's theoretically possible for all practical purposes. It's extremely difficult, right. and you know, the, the, we've had books that have got uh, that have typos in them. Um, if they go into second editions, we we try to remove all those. Right. But um, you know, sometimes simple errors are made, and uh, um, sometimes it, it turns out that analysis is wrong. We try to we try to correct analysis. One of the things we started doing um, was to uh, bring out. Uh, books that had appeared uh, decades, sometimes decades ago, um, and uh, convert them to algebraic uh, notation, uh, figurine algebraic, if if it deserved it. Um, but it took me it took me a long time, for example, to make contact with the heirs of Fred Reinfeld. Now he died a relatively young man in 1964. Um, he was at one point. He's probably in the top ten in, in the U.S. Um, he was a strong master. That yes. it's hard to tell because the rating system didn't it wasn't developed in, until towards the end of his life. Um, but there are some some very interesting books. One of the things, and sometimes it's a, it's a big surprise. I I don't know if you ever remember seeing his complete chess course. It was originally brought out in the mid '50s. Uh, by Simon and Schuster. They used the column format. They had enormous diagrams, and in a hardcover book, it was over 700 pages. Now, we converted the algebraic, uh, the uh, English descriptive to, to algebraic. We reduced the size of the diagrams, although we increased it by several hundred diagrams, and presented it in paragraph form, which means at, at the at the end of the day, the reader got about 288 pages, which had the complete book in it with all the material and additional diagrams. And I thought, gee, this is a, a good all around book for beginners. And 
it has sold amazingly well. I mean, I was I was very surprised. Um, some of his other books are, have done uh, well, um, uh, but because he didn't have the um, uh, the possibility of checking analysis with an engine, you got some some problems sometimes with it, and um, we try to correct that or at least make an addendum. Uh, but right. it it happens. Uh, even to the to the greatest, uh, yes. The the first two volumes of Alekhin's uh, My Best Games collection, I think it's from 1908 to 1937. Yes. Right. Okay. We consolidated that into one volume. We converted all the uh, uh, figurine, uh, all the English descriptive to fig figurine uh, algebraic, um, and. Uh, we ran it through an engine. Now we found a lot of errors. Um, so the question then becomes, well, what do we do with them? What I decided to do is to leave the book intact, just the way he, he uh, uh, wrote it with his analysis unchanged. But when we come to a place where his analysis may be wrong, um, uh, we, we, we gradually put together a document that collected all that all those uh, all alternate analyses, I'll call them. Um, and in the book, if you look at the beginning of the book, it gives a URL where that document can be found. If you're interested in comparing it with what Alekhan originally wrote, you got it. If you don't care, then we don't. We didn't clutter up the book with it. That's the wisdom of Solomon right there, because you know everybody, even though they were great uh, players and and a great analysts and uh you know that that uh series of my games it was a big part of my chess development um you know and i just took the analysis for you know like gospel uh and uh of course it wasn't you know the computers now can find errors in anything so it's it's um you know but not cluttering up the original is, is i did i did the same thing i had the same approach with his um, his uh, New York 1924 tournament book. Another classic. Um, yeah, and now that books like that, um, uh, you need to to have a different uh, approach to uh, whether it's going to be commercially viable. You know, for example, New York 1924 is not going to sell 500 copies a month. Uh, it may sell 30 or 40 copies a month, maybe less, maybe more. But you know that's you know that book is a classic. We took that, and if you remember the original uh, edition um, from uh, the mid, it was originally published, I think, by Herman Helms. Um, uh, and uh, the way they did it uh, was the way some newspaper columns are still written, where they have the the game moves, and then they'll have uh, references A, B, C, D, and the analysis appearing. Or the annotations at the end of after the game right. and that's the way this tournament book was so what we did is not only converted it to to uh, figurine algebraic but we integrated the uh annotations and commentary within the game itself like readers uh contemporary readers are are used to seeing right right Okay, so that that's that's also a great contribution. So you know, I have admired you from afar, and we've met, um, and we have a mutual friend in Al Lawrence. Uh, and I, one of the things I'm going to just say, uh, what I remember um, about you is that you uh, there's an executive board of the National Governing Organization. It's called U.S. Chess now. And back in the days that when, when I served, it was the U.S. Chess Federation. And uh, on the board, prior to the board that I was on, I can remember listening to, to you as the legal consultant on the phone. You dialed in, and if they had a legal question, yeah. they would ask you. That was, that was from uh, 93 to 96. Yes. Um, I was practicing law full-time, but obviously I was involved in chess. Um, that was when Al Lawrence was the executive director. Um, Al is still a very good friend. Yeah, uh, he's a great guy. Um, we uh, out before, out yeah, before the pandemic, we would go to tournaments together, and maybe at some point we'll do it again. But um, your teammates on the amateur team East, all yeah, oh, yeah, we uh, we we've, we've done it all, and uh, um, he's he's a great friend, and and, and uh, you know I enjoy his company. 
Yes. Yes. So um, that that was one of the contributions. And and I talked to Al about that is, is, you know, how do you get him to do that? You know, pro bono. And he said, oh, he's just a chess lover. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you know, I think they Al, Al wanted some a chess player to have uh, uh, some some input legally, and uh, you know, it's not a nerve. But Harold Winston for a long time provided. Uh, you know, he was Harold. terrific. Yeah, still miss Harold. Yes, he recently passed, and um, you know, he he was another you know, unsung. Uh, Harold, Harold 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 Dondas was another. Yes. Um, so. Yeah. I served for 20 years on the U.S. Chess Trust, which was started by Harold Dondas. And Harold Winston was the longtime uh, chairman. And, uh, and uh, it, it, we worked together quite a bit. Uh, the, and the, the two of them were uh, gentlemen as well as legal experts. And, and they made sure that everybody got their chance to speak and their their opinions been, been heard before any decision was made. So I admired both of them greatly. Harold Dondas was from uh, Boston. Harold Winston was Chicago. They're around Chicago. Yeah, I think something like that, yeah. Yeah. And so um, it, it we're running out of time. My producer's in my ear again. But Hannon, is there anything that I have neglected to ask you that you would like to talk about? Uh, no, not in particular. Um, you know, we... Um, I retired from the practice of law about 15 or 16 years ago, and this is what I do now. We publish chess books and we distribute DGT product in, uh, in North America. And, uh, you know, uh, it's sort of, uh, I've been able, I'm very lucky. I've been able to combine, you know, my passion for a hobby with making a living. Um, so, um, you know, thankful for small things in this life. Yes, and uh, well, you've done it well, and uh, you've you've taken the past and English description, you've modernized it into figurine and algebraic, and you've uh, taken the East, which was uh, and when I was growing up was um, not some place we could even travel to, and you brought it to the West, and so your contributions should not go un unacknowledged. And thank you for being my guest today. I'm going to take you backstage now. Um, but I really appreciate your time. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Good to be here. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let me just change my background again because I was, my producer tells me that this is, uh, he, he, he made these things for me. And if I don't do it right, he complains. So let me try that again. One more time. There you go. Okay. So that was uh, Hannon Russell, a uh, great unsung hero of chess and uh you know you may not have known his name but if you bought any of his chess books then you owe him a debt of gratitude um one of the things i want to mention is is that i bring chess unsung chess heroes but i don't know all of them if you know an unsung chess hero let me change my scroll across the bottom of the screen go on send me a note you know tell me somebody's name that i may not know of who's done a lot for chess and may not be a household name. And I'll bring them up. And this, this, the, the chess files, the answers are out there, is on every Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So um, I hope you will take me up on this offer. Uh, and all of these, uh, let me just see if I can do this. My producer's not helping. All of the videos that we produce about the chess files can be found on the YouTube channel, Eid Foundation. So if you couldn't see this in real time live, you can see it uh, as soon as I put it up there, um, which will take me a few minutes, but I will get it up there. And you can see all the previous shows. This has been episode 49. And so uh, tune in next Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern for episode 15. And uh, 50, five zero, excuse me, I'm making a mess of this, but, uh, uh, I hope you do. And uh, who's the next Unsung Chess Hero? Come in next week and find out.